qué gusto visitar las Islas Canarias. Es mi primera vez aquí, acá en, en, en las Islas, la uh, segunda vez en, en España. Um, I'm going to speak mostly in English today, or in Spanglish, but entiendo bien también castellano, si hay preguntas en castellano, no hay problema, ¿ok? En um, mi título, es muy sencillo, es orinar en el neolítico, <laughs> urinating in the neolithic. This is not how the project started. I, did, I never, ever thought in my entire career I would study the chemistry of urine. Um, I was brought to this archaeological site, um, a sh which is a Shiklahuyuk in Turkey. It's an aceramic, very early Neolithic site in Turkey, early evidence of domestication and of agriculture. But I was brought to the site because mi especialidad es geochemica y trabajo en laboratorio de carbon 14. And I was brought to obtain dates, dataciones de carbon 14, in, 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 this, in this site. And I thought that's all I was going to do. Well, this is the first archaeological tell I ever saw, a big one. And I, impresionante, I couldn't believe it. That I didn't realize that these things are a giant pile of garbage. Una montaña de basura, ¿verdad? And there was an opportunity there. From a geochemical point of view, I thought, uh, to try to reconstruct, uh, as it turns out, um, uh, changes in the, uh, the population and site intensity used through time by looking at basically evidence for fossil urine. But this is not how it started out. So this is our setting. Okay, advance it like that. And the, and the, the team, the Tribulacion, comprende uh, Gunas Duru, and uh, also Susan Menser, who's in, in Tumbingen, right? In a very similar laboratory to here, Melis Uzdurum. Uh, jefe del proyecto, uh, Miraban Osbasaran, and uh, my very good colleague and friend, the one who brought me to um, work at this fantastic opportunity, Mary Steiner over on the right, who's a zooarchaeologist. But let me be careful. This is not primarily my research. A lot of my ideas are in this, but this, the credit for this project goes to my student, Jordan Abel, who was actually just an undergraduate, but a very talented one, very quantitative, and uh, this project took three years to do, and it was just this one of the it's one of the funnest projects I've ever done it, because it was so creative, going back and forth, back and forth with this student, just building this idea, building this model. So I'm quite happy to present it, but I want to make sure that you understand this guy deserves the credit, most of it, Jordan Abel. Okay, the the, the overall setting for us Huyuk, which you see, is up in the uh, sort of south central Turkey there on the western edge of the Fertile Crescent. This is the, um, the cradle of domestication, and plant and, and animal domestication. And depending on the site and, and in the animals in colors there, goats, sheep, cattle, and pigs, um, that's the, those are the ages of uh, hypothe hypothesized first animal domestication. Um, basically, we're dealing with a time period that's the early Holocene to the late Pleistocene. And Oshikalhuyuk is off on the sort of the very western end of the um, of the Fertile Crescent, and so we'll be talking about events between about. Here's a difficulty I have. Reto por un geólogo is is you you think in BC and I think in BP, <laughs> so I'll I'll try to do it in BC. But I think it's around around seven to eight eight thousand four hundred years BC is the period we're dealing with, or in BP around ten thousand years ago, and it's about a about a 1,000 year window that we're going to look at at this site. Okay, so let's go to Oshiklahuyuk. It is impressive. It is a giant pile of garbage. And uh, it covers 50,000 square meters, 57,000 square meters. It's 14 meters thick. And um, it's partially eroded. About 70% of the mound is preserved, 30% of it has been eroded by the action of Melendez Creek there. Let's see, is there a pointer? Is that that thing? Right. Which one is the pointer? The red, one. the red one, yeah. Melendez Creek is a perennial creek that flows by the area, uh, and the site has been partially eroded, and so there's a lot of really excellent natural exposure of the site, too. Because So we have an, really an exceptional three-dimensional view of the site. You don't have to depend just on archaeological excavation. It's naturally eroded, which is a, is a good thing. Uh, what else about this? Some similarities to Tenerife, 
That, uh, that hill back there is in Ignimbrita, just like here in Tener Tenerife. Um, and it's in Miocene age. So La Roca Madre in esta región es todo es volcánica, volcánica como, como Tenerife. Okay, um, and that's looking north. What partially motivated this study was the work and publication of my colleague, Mary Steiner, who um, published this in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2014. Mary is a zooarchaeologist, and her interest w was in the analysis through time, starting from about 8300 B uh, BC up through about 7500 BC, so a duration of almost 1,000 years, in the changes in the dietary consumption of the site. So this is all based on the, the, the zooarchaeological evidence. And what she detected or saw was something quite simple, is that through time, over about an 800-year period, we saw a clear transition from the use of small game animales salvajes to uh, domesticated animals, caprines, and uh, goats and sheep, and so forth. And this transition was gradual, so that at the bottom of the record, there's sort of an even mix of, of wild and, domestic, and potentially domesticated, but it's all, the diet is almost entirely domesticated animals at the top. Uh, so it's basically a trade-off through time of caprine versus small game and other ungulates. Uh, and a big shift in the, in the you know, dietary, dietary dependence of the people. So I thought this, this evidence was very interesting, this graph is very interesting, but I wanted to approach this problem from a geochemical point of view. And so that's mainly what I'm going to talk about today is coming back at this problem, but looking at it ge uh, for the eyes of a geochemist and the evidence of geochemistry. And some of the really common wild animals out there, uh, the land tortoises, which are out there today. There's tortoises all over the place. It's quite impressive. The fish from the creeks and other, other large animals. OK, this is a view of the eroded west face of the mound. And uh, it really is impressive because you can see the whole story. The whole 800 years is exposed here from level two, which is the youngest level, you have level three, down through four and five. And what is really important, it's going to be, going to be it turn out to be important in this study, is the exposure of natural pre-archaeological alluvium uh, along the base. And from a geochemical point of view, that's going to turn out to be quite useful. That we can actually sample what's natural out there and then compare it against what is archaeological from a geochemical point of view. And do it over very large stretches of of uh, exposure. Um, some features, notable features here, things like walls, floors, pisos, fogones, con, con carbon, and basura. Lots of refuse right here. The mound is mostly refuse, depending on where you look at it, which is a good thing geochemically. OK? Let me talk a little bit about the archaeology before we get into the geochemistry, just by way of introduction. Going from the youngest levels at about 7,500 BC to the oldest levels around 83, 8400 BC. And some of the changes we see in the older levels, people are living in, I don't know how to say that in Castellano, a pit house. But it's, a, uh, it's similar to the American Southwest, but the early archaeology people living in level four and level five uh, in these small round pit houses that are generally not interconnected with a lot of inner house space that transitions over an 800 year period into square buildings that are tightly packed and the uh, callejuelas, the, you know, the alleyways in between are very, very narrow. In fact, you can barely fit through. So, and, and, that, and the entrances to the houses uh, through, the, through the roof, apparently, por el techo. So, you can have this, see other things like the hearths and uh, you know grinding stones, matates, and so forth. So that's the style of buildings, uh, but it's all it's all a sedentary village, all through this this entire occupation. Okay, what most of the site looks like, as I said before, is just a big. It, it includes some structures that are built into the garbage. There's the structures there, but it's mostly just basura. It's mostly garbage. And that's mostly what we analyzed in this work. Uh, the structures, we can see efforts through time. The sedimentation rate is so high in this site, 8, eight millimeters per year, that's, I don't know, about like that every year, that over 
less than a generation, you'd bury your house in garbage. I mean, I didn't really realize that pe these people, they were like l living in the city dump, you know, they just sort of threw everything out the window and they were just, it must have smelled terrible. It must have been a really bad place to, you know, all this, rot, uh, I don't know, rotting food and things they threw out the window. But one of the problems is, is that in order to keep up with the accumulation of garbage, they had to raise the floor. So in this case, we saw, we see over, I don't know, just a few hundred year period, they raised the floor seven times just to keep up with the, what they were throwing out the window. A beautiful preservation. This is something that's really important and special about a shikla is that it accumulated so quickly, 14 meters in an 800 year period, that there's almost no bioturbation. Plants didn't mess it up. There's no weathering. It's just original, original strata. And you can see the original layering everywhere, everywhere in here. It's, it's, it's physically and, and geochemically largely undisturbed. And that's important. That's a key to our study. And that happens to be my wife right there for scale. So she's about a meter and a half, a meter, meter and a half for scale. Un metro y cincuenta. Okay, uh, as I said, I was brought to the site. That's me right there uh, to do radiocarbon dating. I'm not going to talk about the radiocarbon dating very much today, but it's a whole nother interesting story. What an opportunity. I had an almost unlimited radiocarbon budget because I'm in the radiocarbon laboratory. That's, that's why your samples take so long when, when they're sent. You have to stand in line because I, I can do 150 samples just on this one site. And I experimented with everything, and it was a lot of fun. I, I worked on hackberry seeds, charcoal bone. I worked on uh, wood ash, uh, all kinds of different things, just to see what, what kind, just to explore the, the challenge of dating a, a, a Neolithic tell. And that's a separate story, and it's a separate paper. I'll tell that story in some other setting. Uh, but briefly, uh, the takeaway from the dating, this is the only dating slide I'll show, if you plot ages in radiocarbon years right here on the vertical axis and calibrated calendar years in both BP and in BC right here. Basically, the site extends from, I should add something here, a little sliver, make this unit 4-5. The site begins around 10,300 to 10,400 BP, that is about 8,400 BC and extends down through about 75 to 7,600 years uh, BC at the top of level two. So again, it's about 800 years. Um, and there's a lot of dating that went into this. Okay, uh, dating aside, what I'm really interested in was other aspects of the geochemistry. But I want to emphasize one last feature that I was really advantageous about the site, and that is that down toward the base of the site, uh, you can see archaeological, the oldest archaeological layers, in this case a floor and there's a brick wall right there, and pits that are dug into pre-archaeological natural alluvium. So the material that was there before and there was any anthropogenic impact. And that's going to be our, we're going to do some measurements in that, that's going to be our sort of background. We're going to use these layers right here to get a sense of what is occurring naturally in the absence of humans from a geochemical point of view and then compare it across to our results from these layers and uh, make our interpretation. So that turned out to be really important. And that's a buried paleosol, looks like with a humic horizon. And um, they dug into it and built a floor when they first arrived um, about 8,300, 8,200 years ago. Okay. What's the scale on this? This is probably about three meters right here. Three meters of 14 meters. Okay, some other common features of the site that we analyze, these are things that we all analyzed in our study. Uh, ladrillos y agramasa, yeah, mortar. And uh, casas quemados, uh, ceniza in, uh, in, in la basurra. Uh, uh, semillas de, de uh, hackberry, los, los endocarps. I, I hackberry acá in, 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 in Tenerife. Porque hay en Arizona también, y sabe muy bien, yeah, es muy dulce. No, no hay. Porque es muy común en, en Turquía, Turquí, en este, este sitio también, en donde, de, de donde vengo, en, en los Estados Unidos. And, uh, and you can date those. And fitolitas en, en um, estera de, de hierba, uh, huesos, y por supuesto uh, entierros. 
So all these features available and a lot of these we, uh, we analyzed in our work. Uh, the really striking thing about the site is all of the dung. And you can see it in buried layers like this. This is one of these samples that my colleague Susan Menser was taking for micromorphology. But you also see it uh, just in between the buildings right here. This is a level four, one of those older round, those viejos, those old round buildings. And in between is where they were throwing all the dung. So we went around sampling actually within the buildings, in between the buildings, in the alleyways. And it, I'll tell you one of the one of our chief conclusions is, is people are no different now today. If you want to go take a piss, go pee, they went between the buildings. We really see that. A lot of the urine salts are between in, in settings like that right there. So lots of evidence of dung. And the implication of this is that they were protecting and keeping the animals on the site, isn't it, that for long periods of time. This is, this is one of the lines of evidence for animal domestication on this site, is that there's so much dung. They were keeping them, protecting them overnight. Okay, so clearly capraines are being, being kept or protected on the site based on all the evidence of the, um, of the dung. And uh, we know from Mary Steiner's work that their num the proportion of domesticated capraines was estaba aumentando, right? It was, it was increasing through time. And, so my interest is, is what does geochemistry have to tell us about Neolithic garbage? And that's the focus of our paper that just came out in Science Advances, led by my student, and there's me and the others, looking at the evidence for urine salts, the evidence for urine on this site, and what it tells us about changes in site use intensity. OK, um, how did this thing actually start out? It started out in a discussion with Susan Menser, and uh, she was showing me some micromorphology slides, and she said, you know, there's a weird, mi there's a strange mineral in this, in this mound. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, it's, it's, it's this mineral nitratine, uh, nitratina, tal vez in, in castellano, which is a, is, is a very unusual composition. It's sodium and nitrate. And I, I was so surprised when I heard that. This is how, you realize, a lot of work you do, you have, as a scientist, you kind of go into it with a, an idea beforehand about what you're going to do. Well, this is a situation where it was just discovery on the spot. I saw this nitrotene and I thought, what is the nitrotene doing there? The only place in the world I've ever seen nitrotene is in, uh, is in el desierto de Atacama, en el norte de Chile. Hay mucho nitrotina natural. Es, es, es abono. Es abono natural. But it's very uncommon geologically, nitrotene, and I couldn't understand why it was in the site. But from a geochemical point of view, it obviously requires a lot of sodium and a lot of nitrate as ions that combine to precipitate the salt. It also requires that there hasn't been much weathering or leaching or washing of rainfall down through the site that would remove the salt because the salt is quite soluble. But that's consistent with the site being very, very thick and undisturbed. It really looks like it's geochemically closed. Whatever they did 10,000 years ago, it's well preserved today. We can still see it geochemically. And part of that evidence is, is finding a mineral like nitrotene, a very strange mineral, only belongs in really hyper-arid climates. But here it is in Turkey. We also, uh, in addition to nitrotene, Notice just common salt. Uh, this is actually a dung layer right here. Those are, um, I can't remember what these are. Let's see, this is basically a dung layer. Sferolitas de calcio carbonato, yeah, right. But, but the, the kind that you find in, in dung, which is, I think is kind of, that's it, yeah. Well, there's iris oxalate too, but this is, this is actually carbonate. Uh, but also, in some of these layers, like right in there, if we blow it up, it's actually below the dung layers, it's just absolutely full of salt. That's geologically very unusual. This should not be there. It shouldn't be naturally there. If you do the elemental composition, you see that it's dominated by sodium, which either is going to be halita or nitratina, this red dot right here. 
uh, and also some phosphate. But it's, this is not natural. This, when I looked at this, I thought, no, this is, I've worked mostly in the natural world. I'm not an archaeologist. And when I saw this, I said, uh-oh, some, something wrong here. Something very interesting. And so that's how it got started, everybody. In that conversation, I said, we have to understand why there's so darn much salt in this site. So we did some analyses, and particularly why there's so much sodium, chlorine, and nitrate. So we, we, we did some analysis. The, what we did is we, here's the bottom of the site down 16 meters, and the base of the site, the archaeology is right here at 12 meters. Above that level is archaeological, and below that level is natural. And what we saw is that in the archaeological layers, when we analyzed for various elements, different types of salts, cations, and anions, they were extremely high in the archaeological uh, layers and very low in the geological layers. Now look, this is a log scale, okay? So these are differences of 10. And uh, there were 10 to 100 times more salt in the archaeological layers than there were in the natural layers. So I said, it's not a natural process. It confirms what I thought. This is not natural. These people brought this salt here, but how did it get here? Why? What do they have a salt shaker and go around like this, just sort of you know put it on their food? But we didn't understand it at that point. So this was our initial analysis, just one vertical profile. We realized there's something unusual going on here. So I said, well, okay, let's go back, and now we're going to get a lot of samples from all over the site and try to get a three-dimensional picture of what's going on. So our much bigger sample we got out of the deep sounding trench over on the east side from the west wall. I showed you a picture of that before, and also that trench right there. So, you know, from all different parts of the site, in over 117 samples, we sampled above and below the archaeological layers, and we sampled everything. Basura, excremento, uh, calle, callejuelas, uh, es un examen en castellano. Uh, fogones, sí? Ladrillos y pisos. <laughs> Okay, so we, we tried to sample everything. And uh, here's the big picture. When you analyze and take the average of the 100, the promedio de todos los muestras, the 117 uh, samples, you see that the site is dominated by chlorine, but it also has a lot of calcium, potassium, magnesium, quite a bit of sodium, sulfate, and nitrate. So we looked at that, we got the analysis, we thought, okay, all right. Well, what does this mean? Well, we approached it by a process of elimination. We thought about what all the various potential sources are of these elements. One of the things that you notice immediately about the, the refuse at Ashikla is it's about 10 to 20 percent carbonate. Now, remember the, the bedrock, La Roca Madre, in esta región es volcánica y no contiene uh, carbonato. So, el carbonato no es natural, es, uh, es pero de, de, de donde viene? Well, our first idea is that it came from wood ash, right? And so, I'm actually not, I, maybe I should have brought the isotopic results, but we, uh, Catalina, we worked a lot on the origin of this carbonate, and I think did establish that it is all wood ash. It's, it's indeed not natural. But from the importance and from our point of view is that uh, wood ash contains very, very high calcium, magnesium, and potassium, and in fact, Virtually all the magnesium, calcium, and potassium we, we could attribute or is accounted for by wood ash. Okay, so if you subtract that portion out, in other words, the white parts, which are calcium, magnesium, and, and um, calcium, magnesium, and potassium, the white areas, those, those white pieces, that's eso es de la ceniza de, de los fogones, okay? And the rest of it, cannot come from wood ash, or at least most of it can't. In other words, the chlorine, the nitrate, and the sodium are, are not sources, they're, they're not in wood ash. We have to find some other explanation than wood ash to account for it, the, 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 than Senisa de Fogones. Okay, so the question is, what is this? Where does all this extra sodium, chlorine, and nitrate come from? And this is what the pattern, sort of the raw results look like when we analyzed, here's concentration times in moles times 1,000 divided by kilograms of general refuse, 
of dung, of building material, horrors, alleyways, and then this is natural alluvium. And what we notice is that this, and again, it's a log scale. So these are big vertical differences in the rango de, de valores, it's muy, muy larga, right, in the, on, the, on the vertical axis. That these, um, the, in natural alluvium, uh, the salt content is very, very low, and the salt con content increases in the archaeological layers for all of these, uh, all of these elements. It's anomalous. So how do we make sense, of, how do we interpret that? How do we make sense of this data? The probable sources of soluble salts, aside from wood ash, now we've subtracted out, we've taken out wood ash. This is, this is the, the, sort of the residual, this is what's left over after that subtraction. Well, some of the sodium can come from wood ash, but probably from dung and urine. Chlorine, we thought, also rain, but possibly urine. Nitrate from rain, urine, and dung, we thought. So here comes the modeling part, because what we then did is we tried to quantify the contribution of rain and dung, for example, to nitrate, and isolate by that analysis, by that modeling, the urine contribution. So we went to the published literature and some of our own analyses to try to isolate each one of these components and construct a model. In the end, what we're trying to understand is how much sodium, chlorine, and nitrate is from urination. Because urination will tell us something about population. Okay? So here's the model. I'm, I've done it in sort of pictorial form. You take the total, gar the total analysis of the garbage, you subtract out the wood ash. So take out the wood ash, subtraction. You take you subtract the bricks, you subtract the rainfall, and th all this information, this is what we analyzed. This is, w we also analyzed wood ash out there. Uh, we analyzed the bricks, and this we estimated from published literature. Just um, the amount of salts in, uh, contributed from De La Lluvia, uh, for these for these elements. And what you see is actually the bricks and the rainfall don't add very much to the site. I mean, in other words, the site has sat there for 10,000 years, okay? And it's been rained on for 10,000 years. So how much salt is added by the rain? And it turns out, even in 10,000 years, very, very little is added. So, uh, in fact, the only important thing is the contribution of sodium to, uh, by wood ash. It appara it's, it's apparently very important. But in general, you take that, subtract that, that, and that, and you end up with this right here. The residual shows that almost all the chlorine, there's no known natural process that would, would put it in the mound. It's just very unusual. Most of the sodium, only 25% of it, we couldn't account for. Uh, so it's a mix of natural and non-natural sources. 90% of the nitrate, again, we couldn't explain it. What's it doing there? Why is it there? We can't explain it by these, the, the, these sources. So I'm going to argue that it comes from urine. It's right here, and there's three, there's three reasons why we think that the residual sodium, chlorine, and nitrate, in other words, these, these numbers right here, those values, there's three reasons why we think it's urine. The reasons are, is the proportions of these elements in urine from published literature and from Although we analyzed some of our own. I actually analyzed my own urine. And uh, I asked, it was kind of embarrassing, but other people I would ask them, you know, can I have your urine? And we would, we would analyze it. But we know that, and, and incidentally, human and caprine urine um, from sheep and goats, it looks similar compositionally. Uh, but they're about the same proportions of sodium, chlorine, and nitrate. So that's, I'll, sh I'll, I'll show some slides on each one of these things, but these are the three points of evidence. Let's look at the nitrogen isotope evidence. It's quite strong in support of it being urine, the, the, the nitrates being um, um, uh, originating in urine. And, uh, and at the end of the day, the most interesting comparison is to, is to, is to, is to visitar un, una, un corral de engorda in California y medir los niveles de, de estos elementos subterráneos en, 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 en bajo de la su, superficie es muy, el ciclo de Huyoc es muy parecido de punto de vista de geoquímica de un corral de engorda industrial. Pero en este caso es neolítico. But son muy parecidos. They're very, very similar, okay? All right, so, point number one. One, two, three. Let's go through these slides. So point number one. The proportions 
of residual salts versus urine, you'll notice that the mix is about the same, dominated by chlorine with lesser amounts of sodium and nitrate. So this is what we measured and modeled. This is what's known from the literature and our measurements. Uh, and, and incidentally, it's just the soluble salts that we're analyzing, not bulk salt, but soluble. Yeah, you don't. Sorry to interfere. No, no, please. It's very interesting, the data that you show, because animals that you'll see in the studies typically are well-fed to be producing animals in commercial herds. Yeah. It means that they're getting very high nitrogen content diets and where the conservation of nitrogen is secondary. Yeah. And we're looking at the, residu the residual data that you have as a model probably will be more uh, yeah. for the amount of nitrogen available for the animal in real time Neolithic. Yeah, you're saying that this is elevated in animals today yeah, because of feeding. Yes, yeah. because they don't recycle in the same way that you used to recycle in, in a more conservative economy. Yeah, good point. Uh, we. I read papers that I never expected I would read for this study, and one of them was the composition of urine. And so we found a study where they did wild animals, some wild sheep and goats, and then others where they, it, was, uh, it was in a feedlot. And I think this is an average. But it's actually, there's a, there's a, lot, of, uh, a lot of variability. So that's one of, the, one of the uncertainties in all this thing. But you have to admit that the proportions do look similar, but maybe not for the reasons you're saying the nitrate is elevated in, in, in the modern sample. But anyway, it looks similar. It's not, it's plausible yeah. that this, what, what we have there is basically urine. Okay, the nitrogen isotope evidence is also very interesting because here's a Shikla-Huyuk. The values we get from av on average from a Shikla-Huyuk are about, <clears throat> excuse me, plus 13 per mil. So this is the nitrogen isotope composition, zero is, and, and plus and minus. And uh, for reasons I, I'm not going to go into, but it's, it is true, um, they're very, very elevated in urine. Actually, I will go into it. It has to do with the loss of ammonia. If you've ever walked past a bathroom, mm -hmm. have you ever done that? Particularly a men's bathroom at our university, it's like, ugh, it smells like ammonia, doesn't it? Well, if you measure that ammonia coming out of the bathroom, it will be ele elevated in nitrogen-14 and low in, in nitrogen 15. So the ur what's left behind is enriched in 15 and depleted in 14. So every time, next time you walk past a bathroom, think about that, okay? All this nitrogen 14 coming out and the 15 is left behind. And that's, that's why urine is elevated like this because it's lost, 50% of the urine is lost through deammonification. But it, it doesn't, this is not rocket science. Let's just compare the shikla hue results to think septic, to natural soils, to abono, to uvia, and who wins the comparison? It looks like animal urine. Isotopically, it looks like animal urine, even to, to this day. So I think this is why Science Advances took this paper. There were a couple simple comparisons. You just look at the graph and you go, oh, okay, that's simple. Muy sencillo, huh? Remember that, everybody, if you want. Graphs are so important, and we spent like six or eight months just making the graphs pretty for this paper. It may, it, uh, unfortunately, it makes a difference. Okay, the last point is the nitrogen 15 values at a Shikla-Huyuk and the bulk salt, from a geochemical point of view, look like a California feedlot. So in, in Castellano, es un, es un corral de engorda, ¿verdad? And uh, uh, there's been a lot of analyses beneath feedlots in various places around the world. California is one example, it's a similar climate, uh, where they've looked at fertilizer, feedlot, septic, and natural, but the feedlot values, which are in blue right here, overlap con la cuadra gris que, que son los valores, el rango de valores de Achicla Huyuk, okay? So you can just see there's the, the visual overlap that from an isotopic point of view, the samples from a shikla huyuk look most like our California feedlot. Just feeding a lot of animals, they're urinating, excrement, and it was all just ended up there. Okay, we analyzed different, we looked at nitrogen 15 across a range of different um, archaeological features from natural sediment. It's quite different, that's the stuff down below, below the site, so, um, but we also found sort of intermediate values mixing probably between a pure urine source and a natural source in the building debris and the charcoal and hearths, but found very high isotopic values in the midden, in the dung, and as I said, in the alleyways. They were 
urinating, they can go outside and piss in the alleyway. It's basically what they do. Urinate in the alleyway. People, people in the Neolithic are no different. They did not, they generally did not go to the bathroom inside their houses. Okay. Okay, so one other key assumption. Here comes the model. We're going to try to convert these urine salts into some sort of idea of population and population density. But here's a key assumption. Un, I, I, how would you say that in Castillo? Un supposición. Huh? This is a really key one. Incidentally, I'm trying to learn some Spanish, so that's why I'm mixing this in. Excuse me, everybody. But um, here's a key assumption of our analysis is that this system is closed, that we have a, it, you could think of the archaeological site as a giant bathtub. And everybody stood around and just urinated into the bathtub, and it all went in and nothing escaped. It's a closed system, okay? And I think what justifies that assumption is the fact that below the mound, we have very, very low levels of salt. I mean, that's, these are orders, two orders of magnitude different. And the archaeological layer is full of salt, and below it's very, very little. It's so little that we often couldn't even do nitrogen isotope analysis. That suggests to me that there was no escape of salts from the archaeological site by natural processes down, leaching down through the, uh, and, and escaping out the bottom. It's like, I'm going to treat it, whether you like it or not, take it or leave it, I'm going to treat this like a bathtub. Yeah, with a stopper. Yeah. So the sediment is mostly clay? Yeah, it is. It is uh, the natural sediment. Yes. Yeah, it's cl quite clay. Yeah. So well, that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. the water won't go through. W water won't go through. That's true. Uh, it's actually quite mixed, but there are some very clay layers. But even, even in the sandy layers, we didn't see any evidence of salt. It's very, very low. Okay, so that's a, it's a very important, incidentally, to always state your assumptions. And that's one of our assumptions here is a closed system. Okay, so. Salt content by level, what we observe, very, very low levels of sodium, chlorine, and nitrate below the archaeological site, and then gradually increasing values in everything upwards with a kind of leveling out of values between level and three and two. But again, it's a log scale, so it's a jump in orders of magnitude in an 800-year period in the salt levels up through the site with virtually no s salt in the, in, the, uh, in the inherited layers, in the, in the natural layers. So that's the key piece of evidence. Let's convert this, try to convert this to population or population density. So how are we going to do it? This is how we're going to do it. It's the number of organisms per meter squared. E either, and I, we can't tell the difference between human urine and animal urine. But this is the total is equal to, this is the, basically the model calculation. I know this looks silly, but actually this took a long time to figure out these models and what, was, what we should put into it. But this is, to put it simply, this is what it is. We measure the uh, residual salt. I described that on a cubic meter basis. We know the sedimentation rate, 0.8 meters per year. I talked about that before. And from the literature, we can get information on the urination rate. Okay, And that gives us a sense of organisms per meter squared, so a density. It's, a popula it's not an absolute population, it's a population density okay? through time. So it's taking, again, let me just emphasize, it's taking our measurements, adjusting them for sedimentation rate, taking from the literature the average rate of urination of humans and sheep, and we can come up with organisms per meter squared. And that is what that looks like. That's converting salt to people or to organisms, I should say organisms. And so it's this pattern of, in the natural alluvium, we have very low values, but increasing through time and then sort of leveling off. Uh, it, it, depending on whether we assume a uniform or variable sedimentation rate, it doesn't make much difference. But we see a pattern of increasing estimated number of organisms per meter squared up through time from 88,300 BP to 7,500 BP. And it looks a lot like the zooarchaeological evidence that Barry published in her PNS, PNSA paper. But the difference is, is that we're actually putting an organism density on that. Now, we could, we could go a step further here. And I'm going to do this. And I'm, go I'm going to convert these numbers right here into absolute, absolute population. But be careful. Uh, because the, you have to be aware of the assumptions involved in trying to do something like this. But, and I've outlined some of the 
big assumptions that we made in this analysis. Uh, we, to, to get it population, absolute population, a major uncertainty is the rate of urination. We know that in general, caprines in humans urinate on the order of 550 liters per year of urine, whether you're a caprine or a human. From published sources, we know urine composition, but it's somewhat variable, as we've talked about. So there's uncertainty there. Oh, what, about, what about, what if you urinate on the ground and then all of it runs off the hill down you know, somewhere else? Well, what do you do with that one? Our, in, our, in our analysis, because it's a very sandy uh, material in most of the till, we, we assume there was basically no loss or runoff of, um, of, of ping. What, you urinate and it goes right in the ground right there, okay? We assumed that. We assumed for nitrate that a lot of it was actually lost, lost through volatilization. There was much more nitrate originally present, but about 50% was lost through volatilization. Okay, in red is the big one. Let's think about, let's think about this problem. This is a big one. How, what percentage of the day do you spend on the mound? If you spent 100% of your time on the mound as an animal or a human, then it would be a just simple calculation of population. But what if you only spent 50% of your time? We don't actually know. And it makes a big difference in the calculation. I don't actually know. This is from the literature we took a guess that on average humans and animals spend about 50% of their time on there. And that's the basis for the population estimates I'm going to give you in a second. But that's a scary assumption. Okay, don't really know. And I welcome the help, ethnographic evidence or something to tell me what's going on. We know they spent a lot of time on there. They probably spent the nighttime there. Um, I don't know if you ever hung around uh, hunter, uh, sheep herders, and I've done this a lot in Africa. And the big problem at night is the, uh, the predators come in and kill all the animals. And so you have to protect them. And so, and I imagine it was the same here because there's things like lions and wolves and, and foxes in the archaeological record that show there were lots of predators out there uh, and that probably people were bringing all their animals onto the site to protect them at night. Because we see all this dung, we see evidence of corralling, all that sort of thing. So 50%, yeah, but what about the people? Yeah, definitely at night. During the day, some people would stay on the mound and some people would leave. But what's the proportion? I don't know. I don't know. So there's some uncertainty in the model. It's crude. The model needs work. But I'm just telling you that th that's an uncertainty. But let's calculate the number of organi organisms. So the number of organisms depends on the density multiplied times the area of the mound. And uh, the area preserved 70% of it. And then 30% we just sort of restore for a total of 57,000 square meters. And if you do that, so it's this times that. And this we got from the previous slide. This is estimated from the area covered by the slide. We come up with the number of orga organisms present on the site every day for 800 years. OK, here it comes. So depending on the element you, want, you choose, whether it's nitrate, sodium, or chlorine. So this, this is our analysis. Our estimates of, of the, in, in, in uh, actually it's volumetric, I, is that meters cubed? I guess it is. I, maybe that's in squared. I'm not sure. I might have made a mistake there. But anyway, this is um, uh, the amount of salt present. And uh, that's our reconstructed number of organisms. In other words, around 2,000 organisms per day for 800 years. Now, how you divide them, those between humans and caprines, I don't know. If you talk to the archaeologists there and look at the number of buildings and so forth, probably people that are present, are present there, maybe a few hundred people, something like that, uh, but not thousands of people. There's not, it's an impressive mound, but there's not that many buildings. So probably, probably most of this number is caprines, and a lesser proportion is humans, but I don't know. I don't know the proportion. That's sort of the number I come with. It's kind of a big number. And you could change it if you wanted to by the easiest way would be to change the percentage of time you spend on the mound. I could radically change that value. OK? Uh, yeah, but that's, that's the punchline. That's the, basically what I wanted to say. Here's my conclusions. Go ahead. 
back to the thing. Yeah. So if you're an archaeologist and not a geochemist, and you excavate an area and you assume that the same density of houses are scattered are around and you count the number of households that might have been mm -hmm. possible to cover the tell in a given time. Mm -hmm. Did anyone try to do that? They did. They did on this site. Okay, so what do they think? Well, they think it's in the hundreds, less than 500 people. Okay. So if you say less than five, five say 500, that leaves, I don't know, around 1,500 cap rains. Every day on the site. That's a lot. But in the various corrals and everything all through the village. And in, it increased by orders of magnitude. I mean, it jumped. The, the site usage intensity increased from basically no corralling and domest domestication at level five to in intense usage of the site at the top. I, I wonder how that correlates with the pastoralists. Oh well, I think it, it, it but it, correl it certainly correlates with Mary Steiner's evidence for zoo from zoo archaeological evidence for increased site usage. Or, or yeah, no, yeah. the number of number of uh, herders or herder society versus the size of their flocks. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of ways we can improve this model, and we have big plans for doing that. Uh, we're working on. I want to analyze a lot more wood ash. That's a big contribution to salt. And uh, we drew on the literature, you know, which is the journal of wood burning or something like that, you know, and, and <laughs> it was really strange things we read. And uh, uh, we can improve on that by doing our own burning and the, uh, burning various woods and things out there. So that, there's various ways we can really improve this model. Uh, Deammonification of nitrate, that's something we could work on. We drew that from the literature. But the, the one that hangs over my head is this issue of percentage of time on the site. I don't know at this point. I don't know what to do with that. That's kind of an archaeologist question. Conclusions. Ashukalhuyuk shows evidence of very early domestication. We think that most of the nitrate and chlorine and a portion of the sodium can be accounted for by caprine and human urination. There are major increases in the scale of use of the site over its roughly a thousand year occupation. Our calculations indicate around 2,000 organisms continuously required to account for the observed, observed urine salts. Uh, this idea is pretty new and maybe kind of crazy. I don't know, is it crazy? <laughs> it's certainly fun. Uh, uh, more work to be done on the model. That's it. Thank you very much. Gracias por su atención.